So welcome to Profile 3 TV and today we're very excited to be talking to Anya Brawley from Ardlin and we're going to talk about executive hiring, disruption in business and technology. So Anya, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us today. So uh, I'm going to hand over and let you introduce yourself. Kieran, thank you very much for inviting me to, to do the interview. Um, and um, just to give you a bit about myself, I am a very proud and given woman, County Derry woman, uh, born and reared there, uh, went to Queen's, studied law, um, then moved to Dublin, uh, fell into recruitment, didn't even really know what recruitment was, went into a recruitment agency looking for work and they offered me a role. So um, started in recruitment after I graduated, um, initially just in kind of high volume contingency recruitment, mainly with technology roles. Um, and then within the Reed group of companies, I established um, the Dublin kind of digital media recruitment firm. Um, so that was everything that was happening at that kind of late 90s, early 2000s. Um, after a few years of working with Reed, I moved to Penna and that was essentially executive recruitment. A mm -hmm. uh, London based firm, um, AIM listed kind of worked across the whole spectrum of HR from recruitment to outplacement and everything in between. So worked with them for a number of years. Then in my late twenties, took some time out to go back to college. Um, I also am an opera singer. Um, so went back and studied opera at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. Spent some time in Italy after that, training and so on. And then eventually decided it wasn't for me. So back into Penna for about another five or six years, um, really kind of running the executive recruitment practice on the island of Ireland. So, you know, across industry, CEOs, CFOs, recruitment um, at, at kind of C, C and D level. Um, then when the last recession happened, obviously all the services businesses were really badly hit, recruitment included. And I was offered a role with Invest Northern Ireland to join their team in San Francisco, in the West Coast. So at that point, my son was young and we thought, why not? So headed off to San Francisco, worked out there for about four years, really across from San Francisco the whole way across to Texas was our kind of geography. So huge role. Um, and when I got out there, you know, the brand wasn't great. There was a lot of work to be done with the team and so on. Um, but really, really enjoyed that role. And of course, my role um, was not only to try foreign direct investment into the North, but also to help indigenous Northern Irish companies establish relationships out there, whether that be with universities, with other organizations, but also to help indigenous companies get a foothold out there as well. So absolutely loved that role. Um, was successful in bringing 12 companies into Northern Ireland, two into Derry, thankfully, or I would never have been able to go home. Um, and then when I came back, I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I met with Anne Herody, who's CEO of the CPL Group, who are like the largest recruitment business on the island of Ireland, about 20 different brands, you know, lots of kind of different locations across Europe and so on. And she convinced me to to join the senior management team there. Um, and that was when I established Ardlin. Sorry, this is a bit of a long-winded way to get, get to where we are. But um, what Anne had asked me to do was establish an executive recruitment brand because the group didn't have one. So I established Ardlin and we launched in June 2016. And then last December, I negotiated with Anne Herity that I would buy the Ardlin brand which I was due to launch at the beginning of April. <laughs> Timing is everything, Kieran. <laughs> so um, that really brings us to today. In terms of Ardlin, we're an executive recruitment firm. Um, so we recruit across various sectors internationally, mainly at a C level, sometimes at a D level. We're retained up front and essentially we're headhunters. So, you know, we work on the premise that the best people on the market are usually not in the market. We have to identify them and go after them. Um, so outside of the kind of executive recruitment piece, then I would also do a good wee bit of consulting with boards and with chief executives. And that can range from everything from kind of recruitment best, best practice to ensuring, you know, that they have strong diversity and inclusion kind of built into the, the recruitment process, etc. Do a lot of work on the kind of future of work and adoption of kind of digital technologies, displacement, you know, the millennials, how they have transformed the workplace, etc. I could talk about that for a very long time. 
And so, so essentially that, that's me and Arglin. In, incredible, what, what a journey. It sounds, sounds amazing. So Italy, San Francisco, uh, Northern Ireland, all over. It's uh, yeah. what a journey, incredible. Great, thank you. And, and do, you, do you see that uh, executive recruitment, you mentioned that uh, the best people aren't on the market. Do you see that that's the case in, in most uh, jobs that you're, you're recruiting for? Is, is it you have to really do headhunt for those, those big roles? Look, I mean, you can be very lucky and have a couple of people that will apply that are absolutely top notch. Um, but usually it's a kind of mix of, of both. Now, depending on the client I'm working with, some of them, because of discretion, will not even want the role to be advertised. So it will be done very, very discreetly. For example, if there's somebody currently in the role and there's a process happening there, you know, that can be very challenging because confidentially confidentiality is obviously critical um but you know i think that would be the premise that we would work off which is look if you really want the best in the market you have to actually go after them and sell your company you know the company proposition to them and engage them that way uh, and i mean that can take time it can take time um and i think the really important thing is um, and we're not always in the luxurious position to be able to do this, being able to actually hand pick clients and say, well, look, now there is a client that I know I can really sell. Whereas some clients will come along and you'll think that's going to be a really challenging sale for whatever reason, you know, poor brand recognition, maybe a poor reputation in the market or whatever. So your ideal kind of situation is, is that you're working for top notch brands and you're very confident that you can sell that proposition to people that are currently, for example, working on one of their key competitors. Very, very interesting. And, and what makes someone then a, a great fit for a, a senior executive role? Ultimately, in my experience, Karen, it always comes down to culture fit. But there are dangers with that as well. We know that we like to recruit people like ourselves. But, you know, the truth is, I mean, I've worked on hundreds of, of kind of recruitment campaigns at, at, at that level now over the last 20 odd years. And, you know, if you find someone that not only has the expertise and experience you're looking for but also has a similar attitude values to the organization you're working with you know that is usually your ideal scenario say right absolutely brilliant in terms of what we're looking for expertise and experience but also a really really good culture fit so it does however there are dangers with that because when you look at diversity and inclusion and how important that's becoming um, you know, you need to be very careful that you're not kind of being biased towards a particular type of person, you know, so, uh, but I would say that ultimately that that's what it comes down to. Yeah, and, and I'm just thinking as you're, you're, you're explaining, you know, the, the changes in the industry at the moment, what's happened, you know, culturally, politically, gosh, it's uh, incredible that they talk about having to keep up and uh, run fast. Well, that's it. And if we now go back to that kind of future of work piece. So, you know, for about the last five years, I've been out and I've been speaking with businesses and doing conferences and talking about, you know, how dramatically the world of work has changed and kind of anticipating 10 years down the line, really. Um, and saying, you know, in 10 years time, you know, similar to where, where they are in the US now, we have about 40% of people that will be self-employed working as freelancers. You know, one of the big models they've embraced in America, for example, is a role model, which is results only work environment. So essentially it's all about results. Doesn't matter where you work, you know, doesn't matter if you're self-employed, employed, it's just about the results. So I think that we have been seeing a move towards that anyway, in terms of the increase in freelancers and all of that, but certainly, and, and the, the kind of adoption of digital technologies and so on but and, and remote working obviously is a huge part of that but I mean the last three or four months that whole process has just accelerated massively in terms of remote working specifically um, so you know it it will be really really interesting now to see that kind of transition back to a work environment, what will that look like? I mean, we know that, for example, a lot of the bigger tech companies, companies like Twitter and Facebook and so on, have already come out and publicly announced that their people can work from home 100% of the time. In Germany, they have now legislated that employees can work from home 100% of the time. It's essentially a, a, now a worker's right, a human right. So, I mean, what does that mean for businesses? 
you know, you, there's a lot of discussion now happening around, you know, the corporate offices. Do we need corporate offices? Big shiny offices in the middle of a city and, you know, the expense of that and so on and so forth. Of course, that might be a very positive thing if a lot of these businesses give up their huge offices we might be able to do something about the horrendous homelessness problem, you know. So, but there are so many changes now that have happened that it's actually hard to get a grip of where will we end up even in six months to 12 months time here. And, and the challenges that go with that, and again, as you, you, you've yep. rightly outlined there, even for any business owner, it's it's the quality, you don't even know what next week is. It's it's incredible, you know, a month, uh, it is really challenging. It is, it is. And of course, you know, when you see this in the backdrop of Brexit, I mean, Brexit was what we were all concerned about for the last three years. And, you know, by the end of it, Boris is free as to get Brexit done. I think everybody was prepared to sign up to it, whether they were for Brexit or against it. It was just get it done. No more uncertainty for business. So, you know, now we had just about kind of got our head around, OK, well, what's the impact of that going to be? And obviously there was a huge amount of uncertainty for three years for businesses north and south and across the water because of Brexit. Now we have had this straight after essentially just coming out of the, the three years of Brexit fog. And, you know, I, I mean, business leaders are, are really struggling. A lot of business leaders are really struggling. I think that what is the most upsetting thing for me in terms of the last three months has been the fact that a lot of our micro and small businesses are just not going to survive. You know, the big corporates will always be okay. They've got the resources, they've got the capital and so on and so forth. But I think that is the most devastating impact that we've seen over the last three or four months. And I don't know how we kind of get things back on track there. But again, that will feed into the future of work. So I'm also a board member of Skillnet Ireland. Um, so we're non-departmental public body and our role is to essentially work with micro and small businesses um, through, we've got about 69 networks in the south of Ireland, so they cover, you know, hair and beauty, you know, all these very small kind of industry, you know, hair and beauty, retail, etc. And then obviously we support bigger organisations and the higher education institutions as well in terms of future skills and so on. But what has been interesting with a lot of the smaller retail businesses that we would work with have is that they have failed to adopt technology, i.e. e-commerce platforms and so on prior to this. But now a lot of them that were smart have gone ahead and done that. So those those people will probably survive okay. As we see, retail has been hit massively in the last 10 years with the likes of Amazon and eBay and all of these huge e-commerce firms being able to buy things online and so on. Um, so, you know, for across various industries, you know, you will have seen that technology hasn't really suffered over the last three months. Pharmaceuticals hasn't really suffered. You know, those kind of industries that have embraced technology and are high tech and all of that have managed to sustain and in fact grow. Um, so if you look at Amazon's revenues, for example, over the last three months, you know, so it, it's that kind of, it's a small and micro businesses that are going to need an awful lot of attention, I think, in terms of when we try to transition back here. Do you think that there's going to be a, a big acceleration in the adoption of technology then for businesses everywhere? I mean, I think there already has. We actually um, put out a sentiment survey about a month ago, Kieran, to about 100 chief executives on the island of Ireland. And if we were asking those questions, you know, around, you know, have you invested more in technology? You know, do you believe that even when we get out of the worst of this crisis, you know, you will continue to allow your employees to work from home, et cetera, et cetera. And all of them were saying yes. You know, we are investing more in technology. Our people will be able to work from home remotely and so on and so forth. Um, and I mean, there's lots of positives. You know, I mean, be before we came into this crisis, I suppose organisations had already started to kind of open up and be a lot more flexible around remote working. So, for example, with a lot of my teams, particularly working mothers and so on, you know, I would have said, look, come into the office two days, work from home two days and, and whatever. That was fine because you had a nice balance of been able to work from home, but then that kind of sociable aspect and, and the aspect that kind of gels the team together in terms of being in the office with your colleagues and so on. Um, and I think the other big issue around remote work and full time, and we're all feeling it here, and let's face it, I'm going to start crazy in this little office at the top of the house, but is, 
you know, that, that kind of line between work and personal life becomes very, very blurred. Now, that was already happening anyway with the adoption of technology and, and so on, where you could work, at, you know, at, to 12 o'clock at night if you had a project that needed to be in or done by the next morning and so on. But now that has massively increased. And I think, you know, human beings, we're sociable animals. I mean, I certainly am. I much prefer sitting down and having a cup of coffee with somebody than talking to them on a screen. Um, and I think it's much more effective in terms of business, but we are sociable animals. So, you know, this kind of idea of remote working full time, it may suit some people. It's not going to suit a lot of people either. And one of the other issues that's interestingly been highlighted to me over the last few months around this is that I suppose it's fine for more mature people that have their own home to be able to work from home. They can have their office and, and the resources they need and so on. But if you look at graduates working from home that might be sharing a house with five or six other people, they don't really have that space to, to kind of mark out and sit down and do, do the nine to five from home. Um, so it's going to be interesting now to see the transition back into the workforce, but I would imagine a lot of the younger people will go in first and then, you know, we can phase the kind of more senior people in uh, and, and all of that. But no, I mean, this has certainly accelerated the future of work, absolutely no doubt. Um, and I'm not sure if it'll ever be the same again. No, in incredible. I see I see so much changes. And you think, again, when we talk about remote working, do you think businesses have a part to play in improving how people can work remotely from... from Absolutely. I mean, you, you know, the infrastructure is the most important thing. So do you have everything you need to be able to be productive at home? So, you know, a really decent laptop, a good mobile phone, you know, decent broadband, accessibility, all of that's important. But actually more important... I think is to have a really strong communication strategy in place for remote workers so that they don't begin to feel isolated, you know, and, and they, they still feel part of a team. But that's where, you know, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, all of these technologies are very good. But I think you do need to have a strong communication strategy in place for employees. You need to have set goals and deliverables that they have signed up to and agreed to deliver upon. And you need a lot of trust. You need a lot of you need to be able to trust your employees. Um, and I suppose that works both ways. They need to be able to trust you as well. Um, so I mean it, it it is a very different way of working when it's a hundred percent of the time. Um, and personally with my teams, I like to see my teams, I like to meet my team, I like to pull them together for team meetings and you know, talk through issues, you know, all of that. So um you know, I think if this went on for much longer, we'd start to see some serious issues arising as well, particularly around kind of that sense of isolation, mental health issues, all of that. Um, so it just has to be managed very carefully. Yeah, no, uh, incredible. I'm thinking back, you know, when we started the journey, uh, exactly, we didn't put anything in place. And now we have a nine o'clock uh, Zoom where we all get together, our team gets together on Zoom and we have 15 minutes just going through the priorities for, for today. Yep. But it's it's actually not to add any value to the business. It, it's actually just so we can hear each other's voices and see each other on the screen. Absolutely. To, to remove yeah. the isolation. That sense of camaraderie in a team is so important, you know, um, and that kind of gels the team. I mean, the other thing, interestingly, that we had been looking at in the Future of Work Institute was, you know, this whole idea of kind of disengagement from the workplace. So a few years ago, Gallup had come out saying that levels of disengagement in work, in work and in the workplace in general had plummeted. That in, in one of the huge surveys they did, I think they, they surveyed thousands and thousands and thousands of employees across all different sectors across the world. Only 13% of employees were properly engaged in their work environment. Now, I think a lot of that is to do with the millennials because we know the millennials have had a massive impact on the world of work. Um, millennials, you know, all of those traits that we're now very familiar with, it's very much about the myself um, and what can I get out of this? We've all had to manage millennials <laughs> and we know it can be challenging. Um, I'll try to be as, as diplomatic as possible here, Karen. <laughs> but so there's that, that, that sense of loyalty towards an employer has pretty much gone now. It's what can I get from this employer before I need to move on to, to my, my next kind of, you know, stage of my career. Um, 
millennials want to accelerate very quickly in their careers, whether they're capable or not. Um, and of course, you know, they want to work in an environment that is very much focused on values, diversity and inclusion. All of those things are very important, the whole experience of work. Um, so, you know, in terms of employers and advice for employers, what I would have been saying is, look, you really need to grasp the nettle around your employee brand, around, you know, making it, you know, absolutely essential to have employee well-being at the core of your strategy and from a board level down, et cetera, to, to be able to not just attract, but to retain talent. And so, you know, within this current environment, that, that becomes even more challenging here, you know? Totally, as, as companies are focused on staying alive and... and That's it, uh, crisis management, crisis management, you know, how do we keep the show on the road? It's essentially where people, a lot of organisations and leaders are now. Um, and so a lot of that stuff around employee well-being that had started to move to the centre in terms of kind of what you would describe as progressive organisations, you know, there's going to have to be a lot of thought put around that in terms of if people are working remotely and, you know, that sense of, as I said, you know, potential isolation and, you know, lack of, you know, productivity and that's what it's, it's real. It's going to be a real challenge for leaders to manage that. One of the other interesting things that has come out on that sentiment survey that we did, um, we asked a question around, will you be considering making changes to your leadership team due to how they have responded throughout this kind of pandemic? And actually about 40% of the CEOs that we surveyed said they would be, that they this had kind of exposed weaknesses at a leadership level. So, I mean, everything, you know, everything is going to change here. Everything here. Amazing. And, and you know, you're, you're reaching the areas I didn't even think or consider, just, uh, you know, yeah. never mind, as, as you say, the future of work and how things are going to change. I'm thinking of the, the team, but the, you're, you're even reflecting and, and highlighting that management management uh, and how they've handled the work from home or remote working and the, the pressure well wow. you know one, one of the things that that kind of upset the balance of the workplace was how the millennials approached work which was you know very little loyalty to to you as their employer or the organization very much about you know what kind of satisfied them in terms of what they needed from you but what you'll see now as well is people being able to demand to work 100% of the time from home, you know. And so again, that balance between employer and employee is, is shifting very much now in favor of the employee. And, and you know, that I, I think that that needs to be carefully managed too, you know, that needs to be really carefully managed. Um, and it's going to be a real challenge for a lot of people in leadership positions to manage that as well. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, again, back to, as, as you mentioned, you've got everything else going on and yep. you still, and, and we all know that our people are the most valuable asset in anyone's business. Without them, you're, you don't have a business. But, but how the business is going to operate tomorrow uh, or next week or in six months, is just incredible. Like, well, where, where, where do you start? And, and do you think that businesses... We, we all need to start then looking at our business plans and 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 being creative and, and innovative and, and maybe uh, changing them uh, to adapt for the future. Well, look, I mean, uh, it, it would be a very difficult thing to do at the moment just because there's so much uncertainty. You know, I think what will happen is, you know, we let the dust settle a bit. We see, you know, what that transition back into a, a physical workplace is going to look like. I mean, you also obviously have the fear of a second wave and, and so on and so forth. So what happens then? So, you know, already some of the bigger corporate organizations have made the decision that no matter what, they're not going back until January 2021. And that kind of covers them. But I mean, what does that mean for employees that have another six months to work from home then? And, you know, so it's very, very challenging. Most organizations and corporates seem to be kind of looking at early August to kind of start to phase back. But then obviously they're having to take in all the kind of health and safety considerations and, you know, all of that stuff. And that really is what's, you know, keeping most leaders awake at night at the minute. It's just the, the here and now. And, you know, the things that they've done 
kind of reactionary things that they've done in terms of when this first hit and people were going to be in lockdown and have to work from home and all of that, you know, that will, I suppose, aid them because they have now made the investment in technology. They have, you know, got the infrastructure in place to be able to manage a remote workforce and all of that. The question coming out of that is, look, do we want to sustain that or do we want to try to get back to, you know, a workplace environment and, and so on and so forth. So those are going to be all the things I think that are going to be occupying employers' minds at the moment. Um, but certainly that acceleration of adoption of technology, remote work and flexible work and all of that has just been huge in the last few months. We, could, we just couldn't have anticipated it would happen that quickly. Well, for sure. I, I, I remember talking to someone in the banking sector. They said that for years they've been trying to get people to stop using cash. And yeah. all of a sudden, overnight, they can't get people to use cash. So, oh, well, you know, I, I know. And, and I mean, of course, this can't really be seen in isolation. It's just business. This is a global societal thing, you know. Um, and does that impact, you know, which is obviously the bigger question, you know, are we as humans actually, you know, going to change? You know, that's the very core of it. Are we going to change and adapt and, and all of these things? And what does that mean for us actually as humans? You know, um, so like they're the big, big philosophical questions. I can't answer those. But, you know, they, they mean, it, it, it is the most interesting, but also in some ways frightening time ever. Um, because we just don't know. There's just so many unknowns. Oh, of course. And, and I know you've been obviously over in the States and San Francisco and you've seen all the, 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 the tech adoption over there. And I guess we were a few years as ever behind uh, what's that going. Do you, do you think we we'll catch up or they will move way ahead again and we have to keep running? Do you know what? The, the most amazing thing about working and living in, in, in San Francisco and working with Silicon Valley based tech firms and all of that was just the speed of innovation, the speed of innovation, you know, and the big tech companies couldn't keep up. So the Microsofts and the Facebooks and these guys, they couldn't keep up with startups that were coming out with new technologies all the time, faster software, you know, I mean, it was just constant. It would make your head spin. And I mean, also some of the innovation coming out of some of the Belfast tech firms has been phenomenal. So, I mean, we know that world of technology is just going to keep accelerating and changing and innovating. Um, and, but, you know, I think that also people are taking a bit of time to pause as well. You know, how much progress, you know, how progressive do we go before we say, I think it was C.S. Lewis that had the quote, you know, the, the true progressive that, you know, says we've, we've gone too far now and we need to start progressing backwards, you know, go to the other direction. So, you know, um, but also you, like you look at, for example, robotics, artificial intelligence, all the displacement in terms of roles that have already gone. And, and you know, initially when we were talking about displacement, we were really looking at blue collar jobs. So, you know, if 40 percent of blue collar jobs in the US are truck drivers, we're soon going to have self-driving trucks. So those roles are gone, you know, but actually it's not just impacting blue collar jobs now. Lawyers back office functions, professional services, they can now adopt AI technology, even academics, AI technologies to ensure that there's no bias, for example, in research and so on and so forth. And of course, no room for human error, no room for human error. Um, so with these types of technologies, so you know, you're going to see a huge amount of displacement. We've already seen a lot of displacement, but that is just going to accelerate as well. Um, so, you know, it's it's interesting. And then you have the likes of Elon Musk coming out about this kind of universal kind of payment to everybody because there's going to be such a lack of actual jobs. A lot of the traditional jobs will be gone. I mean, I, I was down in Coca-Cola in Lisburn about a year ago, and I couldn't believe it when they brought me onto the factory floor. Self-driving forklifts, there's one person, everything's automated. You know, it's not your factory floor from 20 years ago. When you would have gone in and there was a hundred people and maybe people sitting sewing and you know no that's all gone nearly everything is automated now so you know all, a lot of those jobs are gone which means that our children need to be thinking about well what actual jobs are there going to be in 10 years time so what does that mean in terms of my education my university degree 
or, or not, um, as we've seen the kind of raise in my apprenticeships, not just in the traditional industries, but in the likes of technology and so on, and kind of shared skills and skills development and so on. So um, it's, it's everything's changing, but never at a pace like we've seen before. Like this is, this is just, it, it would be impossible to predict, as I said, even short term, where will we be in six months, 12 months time? We just don't know. No, it's a, what a journey, you know, to be, to be telling the kids of the future this in, in many years uh, to come. I know, I know. Um, and, and, and do you think that digital, you, we talked about digital skills and, and IT a lot. It, do you still see a, a major shortage in that uh, here in our workforce? Absolutely. And, and you know, it's because these new technologies are being developed all the time, and you know, for people to then develop their skills and be confident in using these technologies, they need to take time out to learn those programs and so on and so forth. And so there's always going to be that lag in terms of, you know, the you know, the talent that is there and the talent that you need. Um, you know, and, and you'll see that with like IT recruiters where, you know, a few years ago it was Java, 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 we can't get enough Java, and then you have a lot of that kind of older traditional technology that needs to be updated. So, you know, the COBOLs and so on that a lot of, for example, the big banks would use. I mean, that's completely outdated now. So there needs to be a huge amount of work in, in terms of even the mainframe and all of the other kind of plat technology platforms. So, I mean, you're always going to have a lag in that. Um, but, um, you know, the, the other issue is not all of us want to work in technology. Not all of us want to be programmers or developers, you know, certain types of people kind of engineering mathematical type people i know we've been talking about stem for years and you know getting people into stem and more women into stem and all of that but that's only good if you're interested in working in stem let's face it so what do the rest of us do um and even for example here in our industry like cpl about a year ago started to to pilot uh, an ai recruitment matching technology and they made their first placement with this technology and there was no human connection or communication at all so you know what does it mean even for the world of recruitment you know do we get to a point where actually because all people have inbuilt bias and preferences and all of that that actually the technology will match people to companies and jobs rather than other people that's a bit frightening though, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, I think as you say, we're going to start, start reversing again. <laughs> we're, now, we're now in sci-fi sci -fi land, really, aren't we? Um, you know, it's, it's going there. You can see the blended approach and then it yeah. takes over. Well, that's yeah. it. Exactly. And now you're, you'll see that, that, that a lot of firms are adopting that kind of blended approach. We use some technology and we use, you know, maybe a consultant or, or whatever else. But... Um, so it'll be, and, and of course, then with you know being able to interview people via video, you can interview people all over the world. We do it regularly. Um, but the other interesting thing is for recruitment over the last few months is that actually companies who have needed to recruit have had to make the decision to recruit, having not actually physically but met somebody. You know, Kieran, you've got the job. I know we haven't even sat down and had a cup of coffee together, but I'm desperate for staff. And look, you know. I'm going to put my faith in you that, that you know, you'll be able to do the job, job effectively. You know, even that um, is, is, has been challenging for, for clients, but they've had to do it. We, we've taken on three people this month. Have and you? Yes, and had to, last night, I was dropping off a laptop at one of the new joiners the first day of the day's house, meeting them for the first time, uh, standing in the garden saying hello, as you say, it's the strangest thing and you're wondering how you're going to integrate them into the team and you've all these challenges. I, I, like, uh, wow, I thought I thought it would be easier to, uh, uh, you know, bring someone on. Uh, oh, in, in, no, I know, I know. It's not I, easy. For both. No, it's not, it's not, it's challenging, but, you know, hopefully that's short term, certainly for now. And yeah. once people get back, then, you know, we, you know, obviously we're, whatever health and safety checks and so on that needs to happen, we'll get back to some semblance of, of normality. Um, and, you know, team meetings and all those kind of really essential things, I think, in terms of building a, a kind of a nice culture for the team and a sense of, you know, inclusivity and a sense that everybody has a role to play and has value to add, you know. 
you know, and, and all critical things. And and when we're talking about you know your business and what's happened, uh, obviously with the COVID and everything else, the, the chaos. So how, how have you had to adapt then and and change, or have you had to do much? Well, really, just you know, the, the team are are working remotely. I mean, we I always had consultants that worked in different locations anyway, remotely. So so that hasn't changed hugely, but. You know what we've seen has been a real delay in the recruitment process because of the fact that we can't fly for example people in from other countries for interviews and, and so on and so forth and you know because recruitment now has become so internationalized you know a big part of that would have been identifying people in australia and the middle east you know maybe expats in america that are thinking about coming home and you know but then a, a bigger package at, at a kind of sea level you'd be helping them to find schools for their children you know a, an, a, an appropriate home all of that so all of that's gone now in terms of bringing people in outside of the island um so you know hopefully that will slowly start to kind of normalize as well over the next few months but um it's definitely seen a good slowdown on executive recruitment and the process itself but it's also seen a lot of recruitment being put on hold because it's just not a priority you know it's just been manage this crisis manage what we have now and we think about what we might need come kind of september time but it, but again I, I would say that there is some companies that probably need to move absolutely I mean, yeah. absolutely oh i and it really just depends again on the company, their CEO, their board, their expectations, you know, how robust they have been in terms of being able to sustain their, their business over the last few months and so on. And, and it has varied in industry as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly had an impact on all of the services and industries here. And and do you think that there's gonna be a, a major change? I know you quoted one of the surveys earlier that, that a lot of people probably struggle to deal with the, the crisis. There's probably going to be a lot of tired business leaders out there while from this whirlwind. A couple of weeks break now. They're talking about the staycation, aren't they? Because we can't head off to sunny, sunny countries, unfortunately, to lie on a beach for two weeks, which would be ideal, I think, for most business leaders at this point. But, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think, you know, there's a big, big chance of burnout. There's no doubt about that. Um, just because of that lack of an alternative, you feel boxed in. Um, and I mean, depending on your personality, you know, as I said, that could work ideally for, for someone that prefers to work on their own, you know, likes to be at home, all of that. But for an awful lot of people, it just doesn't suit them either. So, you know, I think, um, but, but back to, you know, what chief executives and so on have been ha trying to manage, over the last few months, you know, and that, you know, let's not forget Brexit now and, and the uncertainty that we still have there, specifically for businesses north and south of the island. You know, I mean, they, there are just so many challenges for businesses at the minute. Um, and I think the best we can hope for is that, you know, the financial support, the furlough schemes, all of that will have been able to sustain as many of them as possible. But we know we'll have lost a lot of our our great businesses, you know, particularly our, our kind of startups and our innovators that just haven't been able to cope. Yeah, this will be uh, interesting times ahead. So if, if there's a company that's looking for support, help with their uh, senior team, what, what's the, the type of company that you help and what do you do? Do you go in and uh, get an understanding of the business and make suggestions or what's your standard? Um, you know, first thing is you have to know your clients. So you have to know the company. So you know, meet as many of the senior management team as possible, get your walk around the floor, get a sense of the kind of culture of the place, all of that, really know their strategy inside out in terms of what does the next three to five years look like for them. Um, because these are all questions that you're going to be asked by, by people at a, at a senior management level. So that kind of understanding the company in great depth is really important. And, you know, the, the kind of relationship I would have with my clients is, as I'm probably seeing most of my clients, if I'm not working on an active project, five, six times a year, at least, just to constantly check in where are things, anything keeping you awake at night, very big, broad, more strategic conversations. So, um, you know, 
that's my preferred way of working, really get to know the client. Um, because ultimately, when I go out to the market to recruit, recruit a chief executive for, for, for a company, um, I'm, I'm the, the ambassador of my client. You know, I'm their representative. I'm the person that's making the approaches to these people on their behalf. So, you know, for me and for my own credibility, I really need to understand the organization and, and, and the strategy and the direction of travel and the type of person that they want and why and so on and so forth. So that really in-depth knowledge and understanding is essential in my job, you know. And then, you know, in terms of, you know, how can people get in touch with me? We've got a, we've got a website, artlin.com email anya.brawley at ardlin.com you can also find me on linkedin and ardlin on linkedin and on twitter amazing and we have all the links uh, below this video so anyone can click through of course and uh, you know i never realized you, you never appreciate that you're putting someone else's shoes and you know we're struggling to hire great talent into the business but you never realize when you're you consider seeing your team ceos executives wow that is a big 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 decision and a big process so for sure yeah. amazing to get an insight into that so thank you again for your time on that brilliant lovely to speak with you Kieran. best of luck with everything so thank you for watching today's video i hope you enjoyed it why not click on the links below this video connect with anya and check out our lynn and see what's happening in the recruitment world especially around executives very interesting space there's going to be a lot of disruption transformation and change for companies at all level going forward so again it was really good insight today and I say, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do share it on social media and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.